In early July, my daughter Brenna and her friend Anais and I went on a 1,300-mile road trip to a family reunion in Texas. Now, Brenna, of course, was in charge of navigation because she's more tech-savvy than me. So, of course, she looked up the Google Maps and the Waze and all of that, and she found that there were two basic routes that we could take. One involved major interstates all the way, and the other took a more scenic route through eastern Oklahoma, where there would be rivers and hills and almost mountains and valleys, and it would be so cool. And believe it or not, would only take 20 minutes longer. <laughs> so we voted for the scenic route, of course. Now, at age 22, my daughter Brenna is convinced that she is one of the best drivers on the road certainly much better than her mother. So, of course, she wanted to be in charge of the driving. So, that sounds okay, right? Because Brenna would drive, and I would enjoy the beautiful scenery, and everything would be okay, because she would be focused on the road, and I would be relaxing. Yeah, well. <laughs> so, off we went, and we talked and laughed and listened to her very eclectic and not too awful, I have to say, playlist, and I tried to ignore the driving habits of a very overconfident, speed-loving 22-year-old. And all was fine until we hit a very long stretch of terrible thunderstorms in Oklahoma. They were so bad that not only could we not see the beautiful scenery, we could barely see the road. And Brenna drove on, seemingly unworried by any of it, while her mother is gripping everything I could hold on to and constantly saying, maybe we should pull off the road, maybe we should stop. How about stopping under that underpass? Maybe I should be driving. And Anani slept through the whole thing in the back seat of the car. And I just prayed my way through most of Oklahoma. What can I say? <laughs> but the rain eventually ended, and we all survived. And the adventure continued with a search for a not too expensive, but not too awful motel and some place to eat dinner at 10 o'clock at night. Now, both Brenna and Anna East were delighted that the small Texas town that we finally stopped in had a, wait for it, what a burger restaurant, right? Because they were on a quest to try out all of those gourmet hamburger joints that exist in Texas and not in Illinois. So you woohoo, 10 o'clock at night, what a burger. Not my idea of dinner. But thunderstorms and road music and cheap motels and crappy fast food are all part of the road trip experience. Over the last few weeks, we have been hearing road trip stories from the Bible. And it's amazing to me how so many of them have echoes in our own lives and in current events. We first traveled with Adam and Eve as they journeyed out of the garden and had to make their way in a harsh, new, and difficult place far from what had once been their home, uncertain of how they would survive, knowing only that God had promised to be with them. Then we went on the road with Joseph and went from his journey from being a pampered, spoiled son to being sold as a slave, and then to becoming a ruler almost himself in Egypt, an advisor to the Pharaoh, and then being able to forgive his family for having sold him in slavery. What a journey he had from freedom to slavery and back to freedom again. And then we walked with Jonah as he first ran away from the work God was calling him to do and into a reluctant acceptance of his mission. And then he had that troubling resentment of God's grace and mercy for the people that God had sent him to. And last week, we traveled with two very vulnerable refugees, Naomi and Ruth, as they first fled their homes due to a natural disaster, creating a famine, and then journeying to another country 
and then finding God's presence and strength and devotion as they travel together. And our last road trip is today with the man we first met, meet as Saul and the journey he takes to becoming the person we know as the Apostle Paul. And Paul was a big road tripper. <laughs> the Bible records at least three major journeys that he took in his lifetime. He worked his way around the whole Roman Empire, pretty much, plying his trade in tent making and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. The stories of his journeys are told in the book of Acts, and we will get brief glimpses of his trips in the letters he wrote to the churches that he began during his travels. We get just the barest amount of information about what he saw and what he experienced, but we get so much more information about what he was trying to do, who he was trying to reach, and the motivation for all of it. But the journey that interested me the most was the one that he took as Saul on the road to becoming Paul. How did that man so certain of the rightness of his beliefs, so sure that God was on his side, that he even felt justified in hunting people down, bringing charges against them that could and did result in their deaths. How did that man, one who would have eliminated all those early Christians of, if he could, become Paul? the one whose writings and theology have become foundational for our understanding of what it means to be Christians. Think about it. When we talk about dying and rising with Christ in baptism, we are engaging with a concept that comes from Paul. When we talk about all of the divisions that the death and resurrection of Jesus breaks down, when we quote, quote Galatians 3.28, and talk about the walls that no longer exist between people because of Christ, we get those ideas because of Paul. When we hear the phrase justification by faith alone without the, with, apart from works of the law it is Paul we are quoting, Saul, Saul, who once would have killed in the name of God, somehow became Paul ready to die in service to the one whose fellowship he tried to, once tried to destroy. So the question that intrigued me was, how did that happen? Now the simple answer is, of course, the pretty dramatic story of what happened to him on the road to Damascus. The book of Acts tells it one way, and Paul hints at what happened in his own writings but the, port, the important thing is that Saul has this experience of the risen and living Jesus, and he realizes that this Jesus, the one whose followers he's been trying to kill, is the one he's been waiting for all his life. As a devout Jew, Saul had been actively praying and hoping for a Messiah, for the Messiah, the promised one from God, who would restore Israel to her former glory, and more than that, would be at work at restoring the whole world. All the nations of the earth would come under the sovereignty of that one God when the Messiah came. And what outraged Paul so much about the followers of Jesus is that they were saying that their crucified dead leader was this glorious, triumphant Messiah. And that was heresy to him. A dead liberator? That couldn't, that couldn't be. One who is executed as a common criminal, the divinely appointed restorer of all things? No way! Saul had devoted his whole life to honoring, to serving the one God, waiting for God to send this liberator. And Saul would have done anything it took to wipe out those he, who he thought were disrespectful to that God he so devotedly served. So when Saul has this vision of that same Jesus, 
the resurrected, living Jesus, it's like an earthquake that shakes up his whole being. But what Paul hints at in Galatians is that really his whole life, God had been getting him ready for just that moment. As he puts it in Galatians, you have heard how I have been of my, my, my history with Judaism. You've heard my story, how I was violently persecuting the church of God and trying to destroy it. You've heard how advanced I was in the faith beyond many my own age, for I was so zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But God set me apart before I was even born and called me through God's grace. That same God was pleased to reveal to me God's Son so that I could proclaim him to the Gentiles. He can look back at his life and he can see how he was called before he was born. How all of that educating that went on in the scriptures and the traditions, how all of that prepared him for that moment. He was primed. He was ready, I think, for what God showed him on that road. I think we think that what happened to him was this conversion. We call it the conversion, right? as though he's going in one direction and he turns around and goes in a different direction. But I think it's something different than that. I think he's been on this road all along with God and God shows him we're going together but in a different direction. Not a complete turnaround, but a new direction, a new vision. What God began showing him on that faithful trip to Damascus was that God was the one that had already set things in motion, that this crucified and risen Jesus was God's chosen way of bringing this new thing about. And Paul was ready for that revelation because he had been studying scriptures, because he prayed. He could trace God's hand at work in the history of his people. He could see how the gift of law was meant to save and correct. He could see how the prophets were sent to help get God's people on course when they went astray. As he later wrote, he could see how the law was kind of like a custodian of God's promise. Until the people were ready. So when he encountered Jesus on that road that day, I imagine he was pretty shocked for sure, but not entirely unprepared for what happened. When we tell the story of Saul becoming Paul, I think we often make it sound like it happened all at once too. As though Saul was riding one day on his way to Damascus to kill a lot of Jesus followers and then bam, He has a vision and immediately turns around and he starts preaching the gospel. But that doesn't happen, according to Galatians. It's not like that at all. What happens is Acts reports he's blinded. He loses his sight for three days. He's taken, led by the hand like a child to a place where he can pray and he can ponder and he can think about what it means. And then he spends a lot of time doing not a lot of anything. Did you hear that in Galatians? He sits with what has happened to him. He prays. He studies scripture. He doesn't talk to too many people about it, right? He goes off to Arabia. I don't know what that means, but it sounds like a desert experience to me, right? Then he confers eventually with Peter and with the brother of Jesus, And then he goes home for 14 years. And what is he doing? He's making tents, doing the family business, praying, studying, talking about his faith with friends and family. And then he waits. He waits until finally he is called up to serve with a problem that's come up with the Church of Antioch. And from that moment on, it seems as though that road trip that he starts on never really ends. 
He's on it for the rest of his life. What I think happens to Saul, if I can put it this way, is that he moves from absolute certainty about what he believes and how he should live his life into a much harder, more ambiguous place, full of unknowns, roads not yet imagined, and yet still a place of grace and hope and mercy and God's presence. Saul doesn't just leap up a fully formed, newfound Christian after that road. God works with him for a really long time. And what he finds in that, those 14 years, what he finds in all those places ultimately that God chooses to bring him, he brings the message of the Messiah, of the one who he has met on the road, the one that he has met over and over again through those years of waiting and praying and studying. He brings the message of that one Jesus whose life and death and resurrection has changed everything. Paul is absolutely clear about the message and absolutely certain about what he is serving. But what I think those 14 years of not doing too much may have brought about in him is maybe some openness and maybe even a little flexibility and tolerance and grace into the mix. It's hard to imagine Saul saying, for example, that he has become all things for all people for the sake of the gospel. Mm -mm. But Paul does say it, and Paul does do it, to bring to life the one that he serves, to bring to people's consciousness this living Lord. The journey from Saul to Paul is a journey, I think, from absolute certainty in the way he thinks God wants him to live and to act as a person of faith into someone certain only of the one he serves, the crucified and risen Christ, open to the ways Jesus is working in his life, open to the many and variety of ways that God will use him. I was trying to think of a visual image of this change from Saul to Paul. And what I sort of imagined was this idea of Saul as an arrow, focused, sure, deadly, deadly. And what he becomes as Paul is more like something like an open vessel right? Ready to receive, waiting, being filled with God's Spirit, ready to be poured out in all kinds of different directions depending on the way that God wants to use him. Saul, who is so certain in himself, his beliefs, his actions, his righteousness, righteousness is almost self-directed. And Paul, certainly, certain only, In Jesus, the one he serves is a bit more humble, learning, growing, and open to God's leading. Now, we know, if we've read any of Paul's writings, that he, of course, still has very strong opinions, right? He has not somehow become Paul the not take a stand on anything. Oh, no. He tears into those who he thinks would lead lead people away from faith in Jesus. He is harsh with his own critics and outspoken in his defense of his own ministry. It can be argued that as much as Paul's writings serve to break down divisions, Paul's writings have also led to all kinds of problems and controversy in the church as well. Maybe, in part, that's because there is still Saul in Paul. (laughs) So I'm going to say something I'm not sure exactly how to say, but this is it. I think certainty can be deadly to faith. That's where Saul got into trouble. 
not because he had faith in God, but because he thought he knew with absolute certainty what he was required to do because of that faith. He thought God wanted him to go out and kill a bunch of people. Certainty of how we are supposed to live and act as Christians has really messed us up down through the ages. Think of the Crusades, think of the Inquisition, think of the way that slavery was justified using scripture. Think of all the way that Christians have judged and condemned and outlawed and excluded in the name of serving God. Think about what's going, right now, going on right now in our own country. Think of how some of our political leaders are getting a pass for some of their truly awful behavior why? Because some of their policies are, are seeming to serve the Christian agenda. It's unbelievable. I think of my own family lately. We are arguing with each other in ways I never thought I would see. Each certain that our views are the correct ones, that our views are the Christian ones. We take stands, we dig in. Divided not over our belief in God that we are all trying to love and serve, but we argue over the beliefs that come out of that faith. Each of us certain that we are right. And I'm pretty sure it's not just my own family. The whole Christian community is divided on its views about, you name it, right? Abortion capital punishment, what to do about climate change, gun, tr gun control, how, whether or not we build a wall at the border and whether that's right, and what we do, uh, who we welcome into our congregation as full members and who we exclude, what we do or don't do in worship. We argue with such intensity, sure of the rightness of our beliefs, that we become like arrows arrows that wound and possibly destroy all in our path in the name of being right. And I know for myself that the more certain I become that I am right, the more arrow-like I become in my actions, the less able I am to really see that, who am I arguing with anyway? It's my brother. It's my sister, it's members of my community, but I don't care because I just want to be right. There's an issue in my family that periodically brings the inner arrows in me. Many members of my extended family attend churches where women are not allowed to be pastors. Right? How does that feel? <laughs> Can you imagine? They're not allowed to preach. They're not allowed to teach adult men in class. They're not allowed to be church elders, read scripture from the pulpit on Sunday mornings, or even serve communion. So when I visit my family, I have to decide what to do about that. Do I skip? going to church with my family? Do I sit in the pew and pout and groan and moan the whole time? Do I make those subtle little snide remarks that are my specialty like, hey, have you noticed how there's no women up front this morning in church? I wonder why that is. I have done all of those things, to be truthful. But what I'm pretty sure is that doesn't work is shooting fire, fiery arrows of outrage and holy indignation at their backs and hoping that because I'm the one doing it, they're going to have that Damascus Road experience and they're going to change their ways. Now, am I suggesting that we shouldn't stand up for what we believe? and the course of action that we think is right? 
Absolutely not. But I am not sure how many people have ever really changed their ways because somebody shot a well-aimed fiery arrow right into their hearts. What I think that God is calling us to be is more like vessels, open and waiting and prayerful, being filled with God's spirit to be poured out in love, to meet the needs God brings before us, to speak out absolutely, to act out against injustice when we see it absolutely, but to do it with a little less absolute certainty that we have it all figured out and that we are the only ones that could possibly be right. And to be more open with a little more humbleness and a little more trust in God's direction. But that's hard, isn't it? Saul, the arrow of God, couldn't do it, couldn't be that person until he met the risen and living Jesus on the road to Damascus. Until he met the one who would grab a hold of him, change him, and start the process of making him something new. Over and over again, Paul met that Jesus, not always in dramatic fashion like it was on the road, but he met him on every road in every twist, and every turn, and every storm, and every bit of the journey God took him on. He experienced God there, alive, at work, making Paul and all things new. Paul may have lost some certainty about every course of action, but he was certain of the one who traveled with him, certain that he was loved, certain that he was free, certain he was on the road that God had been preparing him from the very beginning to travel on. That's a certainty that we can hold on to as well. All our roads are long. All our roads are hard. All our roads are uncertain. We have so many choices about how to live, how to act, how to love, how to seek justice. But on all of the road trips that we are on, God promises to be there, to be with us, and we have each other. Amen.